Welcome to NET 401. My name is Adam Palmer. I'm a specialist network solution architect with AWS. And this session is using AWS Transit Gateway for your multicast workloads. Let's have a look at the agenda for today's session. We're going to be taking a look at some of the multicast primitives, how multicast comes together on AWS and some of the benefits of cloud. We're then going to take a dive into what you can build, look at some of the common use cases and patterns we see with customers, and finish off with a hybrid example. And then we're going to dive into capability and roadmap with a look to what's new, what's planned, and a hybrid demonstration as well. Lots to do. Let's get started. So how does multicast come together on AWS? Well, the first thing to say is that multicast was launched in 2019 and was picked up by Andy Jesse uh, during his keynote presentation. Customers had been asking us for a native way to build multicast workloads on AWS without the added complexity of building sort of overlay networks. Amazon was, or AWS, was the uh, first public cloud provider to offer such a service. Now, the service is enabled via Transit Gateway, so that means in order to use multicast, you must deploy Transit Gateway first, and you must enable Transit Gateway for multicast services. There's support at the network level for both IP version 4 and IP version 6 addressing. And of course, being part of Transit Gateway means that the service is fully managed. As a customer, all you need to do is define your configuration and let AWS manage the steady state operation of that for you. As we will see later in this session, this service can be integrated with external applications through some hybrid integration techniques. And there's support for CloudFormation and API support as well. So if you're building your applications via pipelines or your scripting using APIs, there's support for that. Newly announced, we have support for Internet Group Management Protocol, IGMP, which enables dynamic group membership of multicast groups. And we're going to cover that in some detail as well. So what exactly are multicast communications? Well, to explain that, let's introduce another common form of communication in unicast, look at some of its characteristics, and then contrast the two. So unicast communications are everywhere. Most commonly, when two devices speak to each other, they do so using a unicast methodology. Characteristics here are typically a single source and a single destination, and the communications are one-to-one. -one. So the source knows exactly who it's talking to uh, in terms of the recipient, and the recipient knows exactly who the source is. The addressing uses unicast IP addressing, uh, and the source actually uses a unicast address as well. So the destination is well known to the source in that sense. At the transport level, we can use connectionless or connection-oriented protocols, such as uh, UDP and TCP. And the communications can be two-way. Now, as ubiquitous as unicast communications are, there are times when it can be inefficient. An example of this may be where you need to send a piece of information to many tens, hundreds, or even thousands of endpoints. If you were to use unicast to do this, uh, you would have to send that information as many times as there were unique destinations, uh, potentially saturating network links. You'd also have to set up relationships. If using TCP, you have to set up relationships with each of those unique endpoints as well. And these are a couple of areas where multicast really shines. Uh, multicast communications, the characteristics here are that there can be single or multiple sources and single or multiple destinations. It's often thought of as an elective broadcasting technique where broadcast sends out information on the wire indiscriminately to whoever may be there, whether they want to receive that information or not. Multicast has some smarts in the sense that it benefits from sort of the broadcast nature of broadcast, but it allows recipients to signal to networking hardware in the path that it would like to receive that information on that particular network segment. From the perspective of the source, the destination is a group IP. So the source doesn't really know who it's talking to. It just knows that there's a group address to send the information to. At the transport level, this means we use connectionless protocols such as UDP and that the communications are one way. So why use multicast on AWS? Well, the first reason is perhaps speed. As a customer, you're always thinking about decreasing your time to value. How quickly can you benefit from this application that you've created and deployed in the cloud? And also benefiting from the APIs and the automation capabilities that are afforded to you by using AWS, you get to reduce your admin overhead and complexity as well. Another reason is perhaps scale. As a customer, you get to benefit from the massive global scale of AWS, perhaps that means your applications, uh, you can reach into different geographies that perhaps you haven't been able to uh, get into uh, previously. And also, it's not always just about bringing an application for application's sake. 
It's what you can embellish or augment your application with. And uh, on AWS, there's um, significant breadth and depth to the suite of services that we can offer. And not forgetting cost, uh, specifically if you're thinking about multicast and you're not deploying in a data center, then you're not procuring network hardware, uh, switches, routers, of course. So this brings down your data center footprint and your cost. And reducing your data center footprint is going to be one of the considerations that rolls up into your overall business justification for cloud adoption. So what can you build? Let's have a look at some common use cases for multicast. Well, the finance sector has long used multicast technologies. An example of this might be um, a stock exchange where a central transaction might take place. Now, once this transaction has taken place in this central exchange, um, there's often lots of downstream um, security and uh, financial parties that need to be updated about the information or that trade that's taken place. And using UDP and multicast, that central exchange is able to disseminate that information very, very quickly without setting up um, connections or negotiations that perhaps might be associated with TCP. And of course, if there are many, many downstream entities to send the information to, then uh, this can potentially saturate network links. So as uh, using multicast, this uh, central exchange actually only needs to send this information once. And if we were to use TCP here, we would have to actually set up the connection independently and send information, as we said before, as many times as there were unique destinations, adding to latency. If we're not using TCP, of course, this also means that we negate any issues with congestion protocols. This is an environment where the speed and fairness in terms of latency of packet delivery is paramount. It's also worth noting that this is also an environment where higher level, uh, higher level protocols and services often take care of the guarantee of packet delivery. Another example will be the media and entertainment space. An IPTV uh, provider, if they have their own network communications between themselves and their multicast receivers or their, their clients, are actually able to use multicast perhaps to deliver live broadcasts, uh, maybe sporting events or some uh, live event that's, uh, that's being broadcast. And this means that the IPTV provider is actually able to send the information once, uh, especially if it's high bandwidth, um, this uh, recoups a significant bandwidth on the lines that they send out to their, to their multicast receivers. Now, a more traditional approach to uh, media delivery might be uh, using over the top or on demand from things like CDN or content delivery network caches. And even in this case, where the, the connection is more traditional to use a unicast, subscribe, and, uh, and pull a stream down from a CDN cache, uh, multicast has a use case here, sort of a front of house and a back of house use case where it can be used to efficiently replenish CDN caches from the IPTV source. And not forgetting information technology as well. Uh, information technology has long embraced multicast tooling. We need only look at compute and application clusters that use multicast for quorum, maintaining quorum in the cluster and failover control and protocols at the network level as well, perhaps routing protocols that use multicast for election control and messaging distribution. So what are the multicast building blocks on AWS? How do we get going with it? Well, the first thing to say is that we need transit gateway, as we said before. So the first thing you do is you create a transit gateway uh, and you must enable this for multicast. So this isn't something you can do retrospectively. You must do this at the point at which you create the transit gateway. Once you've done that, you would attach a VPC as you would normally for unicast forwarding. At this point, you're ready to start your multicast build. The first thing you create is a multicast domain, and this is a sort of a holding context, if you like, for all the rest of the configuration that we're going to deploy. So you create your multicast domain, and you map it to a transit gateway. At this point, you're able to associate the VPCs that you already attached with your multicast domain. And by extension, the subnets that are inside those VPCs, you're actually able to associate with this transit gateway as well. Once you've been through this process, you get to your group association stage. And this is where you define a multicast IP address, in this case, 232.001. And we have a statically defined source and some statically defined members. Some things to note here. Uh, you must, as I said before, enable transit gateway uh, multicast services. When you create that transit gateway, you can't do this retrospectively. If you want to send multicast packets to the group, your group source must be a Nitro-based instance, but members are more flexible. They don't necessarily have to be Nitro-based instances. And transit gateway being a regional service, uh, this extends to the multicast capability as well. So multicast is inherently a regional service. 
And in order to take part in a multicast domain, you must be in a subnet that is associated with a VPC that's been associated with that multicast domain as such. So what about a real world use case of multicast on AWS? Well, Singapore Exchange embarked on a proof of concept to see whether they could build a cloud native exchange architecture. And to do this, they brought um, a critical piece of their financial portfolio, the matching engine. And what they wanted to see was that they could use performance test servers to submit some, uh, some trades against this matching engine using Unicast. And then what they did was they measured the time it took for the information about those trades to come back to their performance testing servers. And they made sure that they came back within certain thresholds and that it was fairly distributed between the performance, server, uh, performance and testing servers. There was some aspirational goals of less than 100 microseconds for these updates. And um, the PSC was successful with a, with a successful spread, if you like, of latency uh, uh, across these performance test servers, which was um, successful in the terms of the customer's eyes. When we look at this quote here uh, from Peter Shen, uh, we're encouraged at AWS that critical financial workloads such as these can be built on and migrated to AWS. So we've spoken about the building blocks for multicast, some of the use cases, but it's common for customers to already have um, uh, deployments of multicast applications in their estate. So how would a customer go about integrating these applications with a cloud native build? Let's talk about that now. So we start again with our AWS cloud, perhaps an account there. Uh, we define a VPC, uh, two availability zones and a couple of subnets. First thing we're going to do is we are going to deploy a transit gateway and we are going to attach that transit gateway to a VPC attachment to the VPC here. Now, at this point, we can configure our multicast domain and we can go through the process of defining the group IP 232.0.0.1 in this case. And we have our group source defined and our group member. Now, at this particular juncture, this would be a working multicast application. So how do we now extend this outside of the cloud space? Let's introduce some external locations. You can see we have four here. And you'll notice that two of them are connected by AWS, uh, AWS Direct Connect and two are connected by a VPN. Now, the method you choose here is not fixed. The only requirement is that there's private IP connectivity between these subnets and the remote locations, or more specifically, between some um, routing hardware in those remote locations. And the reasons for this will become clear momentarily. The next thing that we do, uh, do is that we deploy some virtual router instances. Uh, and these virtual router instances must be capable of running uh, a routing protocol, such as protocol independent multicast, and also a tunneling mechanism uh, and a protocol such as generic routing encapsulation, GRE. Now, whether or not these routers become sources or members will become clear momentarily, but this has to do with where the source of your multicast packets originate from. We bring up a GRE tunnel in this case between these virtual routers and the physical routers in the remote locations. And over the top of those tunnels, our multicast routing adjacencies form in the case of PIM here. And this enables the multicast packets to flow encapsulated over these GRE tunnels over either Direct Connect or your virtual private network connections. If we now introduce the concept of where you have sources and members outside, um, if we look to the left-hand side of the diagram, we can see that we have a data center in the top left that actually has um, some instances or some services that generate multicast packets. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that our virtual router instance inside the data center on the left-hand side, rather in AWS, uh, is defined as a source because this is essentially going to receive multicast packets over that tunnel, and it's going to forward them to Transit Gateway, and Transit Gateway is then going to forward it onto all the rest of the members. We can see on the right-hand side that we actually don't have any sources outside, and therefore our virtual router need only be a member in this case. For more information and guidance on how you can go ahead and build this, check out this blog. So capability and roadmap. What about some of the new features uh, we've released recently? So IGMP version two is uh, a feature we've announced uh, support for recently. An internet group management protocol enables clients to uh, dynamically and natively register themselves as being interested in receiving or um, information sent to a multicast group, as I explained a little bit earlier when we talked about um, clients using the sort of inherent network capability uh, of switches and routers to forward information to their segments. 
So how would this work on AWS? Well, let's step through an example. So we have some instances here that um, have effectively opened up an application that is multicast aware, and they signaled their interest to join the multicast group by plugging in the multicast group IP 232.001. This is the process that's often called joining the group. At the network level, this generates what's called an IGMP report. And that IGMP report contains just enough information for networking equipment to understand that it has interested clients on a particular network segment and that it should open up or it should forward information to those clients. Now, these reports are intercepted by Transit Gateway. And Transit Gateway then knows that it has those recipients on that particular elastic network interface inside that subnet. Now, you'll notice here that we have an instance that's just begun streaming. We haven't defined it as a source. And that's because once we have IGMP support enabled on our multicast domain, we no longer have to statically configure members or sources. This all happens automatically. At the point at which those packets arrive on Transit Gateway, Transit Gateway begins to forward those to the members that have registered their interest. <clears throat> Uh, some of the benefits here, uh, sources, we said before, no longer need to be statically defined. So you don't have to go into there and define which are your sources for your particular application. Uh, your workloads are able to dynamically scale and contract, which is probably more akin to the way that multicast applications work um, outside of AWS. So this feature is probably more, more in line with that capability. If you're migrating workloads that are already using multicast capability, all you need to do is set up the, uh, the multicast domain configuration and bring those workloads into the cloud. And what this really means is it's a reduction of administrative overhead from the perspective of you, uh, you bringing your workloads or you're building your workloads on AWS. So in terms of regions and availability, I said before that we announced support for the service in uh, 2019. So that was Q4 2019. And in Q3 uh, 2020, we announced support for multicast in an additional eight regions across Europe, Asia, and South America. And Q4 2020, we were worldwide with multicast in all commercial regions and China regions. So what are some of our multicast roadmap considerations? Where do we think this is going to go? Well, we saw earlier that there are ways to create hybrid integrations between the native deployment of multicast on AWS and your existing data centers. This is somewhere where we're giving a lot of thought to, and we'd like to offer this capability to you natively without the ability or the requirement rather to deploy multicast capable or tunneling um, virtual routing instances. So this is something we're going to try and surface for you. Uh, Additional control over filtering and access control lists around your multicast domains, who can join the multicast domains and who can't. IGMP version three has been asked from customers as well. And IGMP version three has um, enhancements around from whom uh, a recipient actually receives information, a specific, specifically source-specific multicast. So a recipient can actually choose the, um, the stream it wants to uh, receive information from. So this is an area of development for us as well. And it's on our roadmap. And not forgetting uh, IP version 6 with MLD version 1. We're going to cut to a short demo now, and I'll see you on the other side. Let's talk a little bit about the architecture that's in front of us. This is a hybrid multicast configuration. What we're doing here is defining a multicast domain and group and members and sources on the left-hand side and within AWS. And we are extending that to the customer data center using hybrid connectivity techniques and some overlay networking. Specifically, we have sources on the right-hand side, in our case, a single Linux machine. In the customer data center, we have a physical router that is capable of running multicast routing protocols such as PIM, protocol independent multicast, and tunneling methods such as GRE. This enables our physical router in the customer data center to establish a tunnel with a virtual router that runs inside AWS. And in turn, this enables the multicast packets to flow across the tunnel. We have EC2 instances inside AWS that are interested in receiving the stream sent by our multicast sources on the right-hand side. Let's jump into the AWS console and have a look at the configuration. So inside AWS, you can see we have our transit gateway defined already. If we look at the attachments for this, these are your standard attachments that you would normally have. So we have a direct connect gateway that is attached as we can see here. 
and we have a single VPC that's attached as well. This is our multicast VPC. Inside this VPC, we have some instances. If we have a look at the multicast domain configuration, we can see this is defined already and it's attached to our transit gateway. If we have a look at the associations, we can see here that we have four subnets and we have a single VPC attached. Now these are the same subnets and VPC that would have been associated with the transit gateway previously. If we look inside the group definition here, we can see that we have a group IP address of 232.0.0.1 and that we have four ENIs or network interfaces that are attached to this group IP. Now three of these are members, meaning that they wish to receive multicast packets sent to that group IP and one is a source. Now this source is actually our virtual router that is defined inside AWS. If we have a look at the instances we have here. As before, we have our multicast router. And then we have three nodes. Uh, two of these are Linux machines and one is a Windows machine. And the Windows machine is down here in the left hand side of my screen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send some ICMP data as you see up here on the left hand side of the screen in the blue box. This is the Linux machine that's existing in our data center, in our customer data center. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to ping the multicast group address at 232.0.0.1. What we should see is this information being encapsulated, sent through the GRE tunnel and fanned out to the members of that multicast group inside AWS. Now to prove the delivery here, on these two Linux instances, we have a TCP dump running that's specifically looking for ICMP traffic. So when I send this ping, we should see it rendered on the screen. Let's do that now. As you can see, the debug is coming up and we can see the ICMP packets being sent to the 232 address. And we can see that on both instances. Now I didn't send that to a unicast address, I sent that specifically to a group address. So we can see that this is multicast in action. So sending ICMP data is one thing, but we can do something better than that. So let's stop this ping now and just jump down to this Windows machine here. Now you can see Wireshark is running here. And also because this machine is a member of the group, it also trapped that information in the debug trace, as we can see. Let's just clear the screen here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to send some video. Now this is a video that's been prepared into transport stream format and we're going to use FFmpeg to send this information to the same group address. And what we should see is inside Wireshark, we should see the debug trace coming up again, but also we should see VLC behind, as we'll see in a second in this window here, rendering the video and displaying it. Let's have a look at the command. So we're going to use FFmpeg. We're going to take the stream file in transport stream format. We're going to copy all of the streams and we're going to send it to the UDP address 232.0.0.1, a specific port. And because it's MPEG, we're going to specify the packet size. Let's do that now. So in our debug trace, we can see the information is being detected as, uh, as MPEG format. Uh, with a destination of the multicast group address 232.0.0.1 and in the back VLC is receiving and rendering the video. Thanks for watching. So wrapping up, uh, we've seen that multicast uh, is well suited for particular workloads. Perhaps those, uh, those workloads are sensitive to uh, network saturation in the case of sending large pieces of information many, many times, or perhaps you've got bespoke, perhaps financial applications that could benefit from multicast. Uh, we've seen the inherent benefits of building on and migrating a scale to AWS around cost and, and speed. Uh, and also that some, uh, you know, uh, 
multicast in itself is a managed service, so all you need to do is define uh, the configuration and you allow AWS to operate that infrastructure for you. We've seen also that you can integrate that deployment of multicast on AWS and then extend it to existing locations using some hybrid integration techniques. But also, as I covered on our roadmap, this is an area we'd really like to give to you natively. And this is uh, certainly on our roadmap, on our agenda to be looking at. As a customer, you can get started right now in the console with support for CloudFormation and API support. Thank you very much for watching. Thank <laughs> you.